can sing loud enough when I'm singing for you, my God. No, I can't sing loud enough. I can't sing loud enough when I'm singing for you. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you here this morning. As we enter into July and continue into the series of the Lord's Prayer, we're welcoming you to Coda, where we have worshiped to uh, come to worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so just thank you for being here this morning. Uh, our heart's desire is to put Christ in the center of everything that we say and everything that we do. Um, and so as we get to celebrate a communion at the end of the sermon today, uh, you'll find those little cups in your seat there, and so make sure you grab, grab those, and you don't want to sit on those things, um, but it's always an honor to be able to, as a family, gather and worship through the teaching of God's Word, the singing of God's songs, and praying to a, a mighty and majestic Creator. And so as a call to worship this morning, I'd like to, to read John 1 and then Revelation 4 uh, to us to prepare our hearts as a call to worship this morning. So John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Revelation 4, 6 says, And, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed, and they were created. Pray with me. God, we are so thankful that you are a perfect and glorious and great God. A king worthy of all of our attention. And uh, I pray that you would draw us into your presence through the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. As we've come to uh, just surrender, Lord, to you, that your will would be done. As your creators, we worship you, Lord. As, you, as you've created us, uh, we worship you, Lord, as our creator. And so we're so thankful that your word gives us hope and gives us truth. It puts things in order for us. It draws our heart uh, to the deepest longing and intention that it needs, and that is to, to know you as Savior. And so, Lord, I pray you are glorified your worship this morning. We pray this in the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with me as we worship this morning. Sing like never be 
you may be seated. Let's pray. Father God, we come this morning and we are thankful that you are a God that pursues us and that you desire for us to be with you and that you've created this thing called prayer that we're able to commune with the eternal God and you invite us into your very presence to spend time with you and that is what you created us for to know you and to be with you and it's in knowing you and it's in with being with you that we find the fullness of what it means to be alive and the fullness of what it truly means to be human and so God, as we spend time this morning thinking about your word, in particular as it relates to prayer, would you just do a work in our heart? Would you encourage us who maybe struggle in this area to step in and to just spend that time with you? And those of us who maybe do a little bit better, would you invite us even more deeper into your presence through prayer and we pray that as we pause and we think about your word that you would open our hearts and our minds to see what is spoken and that you would teach us by your spirit and convict us and encourage us and we pray and ask these things in Christ's name amen well good morning if you are uh, new with us or uh, just visiting with us, my name is Andy Hall. I have the privilege of leading our youth here at CODA, who, by the way, are downstairs with some of our other youth leaders, so they're not running wild down there. Uh, so they are down there this morning, and it is a privilege to be able to just to uh, lead them and to teach them and to be with them. And so, uh, but this morning, I have the privilege of preaching. And so we started last week, Luke introduced a series on prayer, specifically on the Lord's Prayer, uh, and it's a five-week series, so this is week two in that series, and uh, so we'll be in Matthew chapter six this morning. If you have, uh, if you want to grab the blue Bible in front of you and the seat in front of you, I think it's page uh, uh, 1012, I think you can find it on that page, and so we're going to continue with our study this morning, looking at the Lord's Prayer uh, Chapter 6, verses 9 through 13 um, is where you can find the prayer. Now, before we read the passage, uh, the Lord's Prayer is located within a larger sermon, which is the Sermon on the Mount, probably, arguably, the greatest sermon ever preached, ever spoken. And so in this sermon, Jesus is leading us, and he's describing to us what the kingdom of God looks like. In essence, it's Jesus' kingdom manifesto. He's explaining to us what it looks like to live life under the rule and the reign of the king, of Jesus. He's helping us see what it looks like as humans to live the most abundant and the most flourishing kind of life. The life that we are intended to live as God's people. And at the very heart, at the very center of this massive sermon, we have this expanded teaching on prayer. He spends more time on this topic than he does any other topic within the sermon on the Lord's Prayer. And so let's read what Jesus says about prayer. I'm going to start in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read down through verse 13. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand in the pray and pray in synagogues and at street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
This is the word of the Lord. And so what I want to do this morning, before we jump in to the verses that we'll be looking at today, which will be verse 9 and verse 10, I want to think in terms of two big ideas as it relates to this prayer. The first is how, how we frame our prayers. Now, we certainly can um, pray this prayer as it is written, but I think the prayer not only is for that, but it's also intended to help frame our prayers. It's, it's meant to be a, a framework or a scaffolding of our prayer life. Uh, I have several commentaries on uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and one of those written by Jonathan Pennington, he writes this concerning the Lord's Prayer. He says, the prayer is not the only prayer that the Christian can or should pray, but rather it is a model of what kind of petitions a God-oriented, how God-oriented sh- uh, should mark the Christian life. It is a scaffolding around the tower of prayer or, or uh, guided handrails of which a disciple walks in forming his or her own prayers. And so I think as we think about our own prayer life, that this is a great place to start in forming and growing in our own prayers. And I would encourage you, if you have not already, to memorize the Lord's Prayer. It has a nice rhythm to it. Some of you may already have it memorized, but if you haven't, I would encourage you to do that because it helps to guide and form our own prayers as we spend time communing with the Lord in prayer. So that's the first thing, is to think of it uh, not just as a prayer, but as a framework for our times of prayer. The second thing is that this prayer builds on itself. So I want to go back to a little bit of what Luke was talking about last week, not because he missed anything, but it's important for us to see that verse 9 builds to verse 10, and in fact, the whole prayer builds on itself. And so Luke mentioned last week that the Lord's Prayer mirrors the Ten Commandments. The Lord's Prayer is, you can think of it in two sections, much like the Ten Commandments, you can think of it in two sections. The first half is very much Godward focused, Godward oriented, and it's dealing with our relation with the Father, where the second half is much more human oriented or human focused in terms, on our, in terms of our relationships with, with one another and our human needs. And so when we talk about these verses, verse 9 and 10, it's important to see that they go together, that they build on one another it, towards this Godward orientation of the first half of the Lord's Prayer. And so the first half of the prayer really has three requests. There are three requests in this first half, much like the second half has three requests. And this might be a little bit confusing simply because of the way that we've broken up the sermon series, but it also might be confusing as you look at your Bible, the way that the verses are designated in your Bible, you might not see that. But the the prayer begins here, Our Father in heaven. And so the orientation is Godward. It's upward towards God. Our Father in heaven. And then it's followed by three requests. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. So in other words, the prayer is saying, Our Father in heaven, let your name be hallowed. Let your kingdom come. And let your will be done. And so what we're asking God for in these three things is that God God would make his name hallowed that God would make his kingdom come, and that God's will would be done in its full expression here on earth as it is as, as a reality already in heaven. And so what, what I want us to do, I want to think about these requests in this way this morning. The first one is, God, get the attention. The second one is, God, have the power. And the third is, God, take control. So that's the prayer that we're praying. Our Father in heaven get the attention, have the power, and take control. And so let's take those in order. God, get the attention. So Jesus knows the nature of sin. Jesus knows that sin is pervasive, that it affects everything about us. In our rebellion against God, our turning away from God, our isolation from God, our walking away from God doesn't just affect the world around us, but it deeply affects us. It affects our heart. It affects our motives. It affects uh, our beliefs. It affects our thoughts. It It affects our behaviors. And we know this to be true because if we're honest, most of us live self absorbed, self obsessed lives. 
But think about how we process our interactions with people, with events, and with experiences. We think about how are they affecting me? How does it reflect upon me? And in many cases, we find our identity in these various things. The reality is we crave the attention of others. We crave people's attention. I mean, think about why social media exists. If it wasn't for this inherent desire for people to watch us and to pay attention to us, then things like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and whatever all the other social media outlets are would cease to exist because there's no other utility for them. So we know this to be true. And Jesus knows this to be true. He knows that sin is so pervasive that it can take a good thing and turn it into a simple thing. It can even corrupt prayer itself. When prayer becomes nothing but an external exercise motivated by an empty righteousness of what people might be thinking about us or to garner attention versus this internal transformation that takes place in us that leads us to a prayer life that is life-giving and sincere. And this certainly fits within the context of what Jesus is talking about when he talks about prayer. If you go up to the very beginning of chapter 6, look at verse 1. Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. This is how Jesus on-ramps into this discussion about prayer. He uses this phrase, practicing your righteousness before others. It's a kind of righteousness that is external only. In other words, it's a praying to impress people. It's a praying to garner the attention of others. Regardless of what words you use to address God, the audience is not actually God. The audience is other people. And whatever reward you're seeking, you will find it because the reward that you're seeking is the attention and the accolades of others. And it's a lesser kind of righteousness that Jesus is talking about that's based on some kind of external uh, appearance or some kind of religious performance exercise. Now let me be clear and let me restate what, what Luke talked about last week. Jesus here is not condemning public prayer at all. Jesus is speaking about the motive, not the mode, of our praying. What Jesus is after is a greater righteousness, a righteousness that is another kind, wholly different kind of righteousness, a righteousness that is generated by the Holy Spirit and results in an internal transformation of the heart where God changes you from the inside out so that what is on the outside is a true reflection of what is on the inside, is a wholehearted kind of righteousness that Jesus is after. And so this is why the opening line of the Lord's Prayer is so important and so crucial. Our Father in heaven. Because it's the antidote to praying prayers that otherwise are designed to impress others and garner the attention of others. And so Jesus knows that our motive on how we pray and why we pray is directly connected to what we believe about the one that we're praying to. In other words, your prayers reveal what you believe about your relationship with God. Martin Lord Jones, commenting on this, says, There is nothing that tells the truth about us as Christian people so much as our prayer life. Your prayers will reveal how you believe God relates to you and how you relate to God. And so right here, from the very beginning, at the very beginning, Jesus says, here is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, get all of the attention. Make your name hallowed. Praise and attention be to you. So let's, let's pause and take an internal uh, examination of our own heart and think about your own prayer life. When you pray, who is the point Who is the focus? Why do I pray? What is my prayers all about? Maybe you ask yourself, what am I believing or what is my motivation for why I am praying? What is it that I'm thinking about God and about myself and about other people? 
Maybe for some of us, we need to flip that around and ask the question more like this. Why do I not pray? Why don't I pray in front of others? Whether my mission community or my DNA group or just with other people. Why do I not pray out loud? You see, for some of us, we need to ask, why do I pray? And others, we need to ask, why do I not pray? Because in both cases, it reveals our motives and our beliefs. Because what it might be revealing is that our audience is not God, but other people. And the attention that we crave most is our own. So it might be that we're praying, God, get the attention of the world so that the world praises you and sees your glory and calls your name holy, but we can't really pray that the world pays attention to God until we pay attention to God. And so we might be praying, God, get the attention, when we might ought to be praying, God, get my attention. And so Jesus, right here at the very beginning, he begins to reorient our heart by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven reminds us not only of our position before Him, but His position before us. Our Father is above all things. Our Father is beyond all limits of time and space. He sees all things. He's not limited by uh, by power or ability or the structures of the world. He has authority over all things, and there is nothing that is too difficult for Him. And He is in heaven, where everything is as it ought to be. That's the very nature of what heaven is. It's not clouds of some ethereal existence where you're just floating around. It is where God's rule and reign have its most full and perfect uh, expression and experience. And as our hearts are reoriented to our Father in heaven who loves us perfectly and dwells where all things are perfect, we're asking him to make all things as they ought to be in my life and in my relationships and in the world around me. And he says, hallowed be your name. Why? Because if we're going to pray in accordance to the truth of who God really is, with how God, what God really does, and how God really relates to us, then we need to know who he is, and we need to know what he is like. The name in the Bible, when you come across names in the Bible, they're not just the way in which you refer to somebody or you identify uh, who they are. It's an identification of what they're like. This is why God himself introduces himself through his name when he says, I am who I am. It's a way of saying, I am what you need. I am what sustains you. I am life itself. I am joy itself. I am love itself. Everything that you long for is found in me and me only. I am who I am. And so when we say our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, we're asking God to realign our hearts with who he is and where his position rightly should be in our life. To hallow something is to set it apart as holy meaning that it's different, that it's above, that it's, that it's worthy. And so if we think about the Ten Commandments again, the first part of the Ten Commandments is how we relate and respond to God. And the second part of the Ten Commandments is how we, in light of the first part, how we relate and respond to those around us. The Lord's Prayer follows that same pattern. And so if you think about the very first commandment, As God speaks it in Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3, when he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So when we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, what we are saying is, I will have no other gods before you. You are my hope above all else, above all other people, all of the circumstances, opportunities, events, or things. Get my attention because you are my Father and your name tells me what you are like. You are holy. See, Jesus knows that not only do our prayers reveal the kind of relationship that we have with God, but it also reveals the kind of God we believe we're praying to. And so we give more and more attention to God. And as we do that, this transformative work begins to happen in us where we find that he is far more interesting than we are. And we begin to discover that he is far more satisfying than we are in the things of this world. 
and that he is far more glorious and that he's far more beautiful and that in him there's far more depth and nuance and mystery. And as we give our attention upward to the only one who is worthy to satisfy, we will want more and more and more of him and want to be in his presence. And so Jesus says, begin your prayer this way. Our Father in heaven, get my attention. Make your name hallowed. Praise and glory and honor is yours. The second request is your kingdom come. So God, get the attention, get my attention. Second is have the power. Now, there is a, a lot of overlap between your kingdom come and your will be done. So I want to uh, differentiate the two this way. When we say your kingdom come, it is to say, God, you are the one who sets the rules and you are who defines reality. You get to say what is right and what is wrong. You get to say what is good and what is bad. You get to say what is true and what is false. You get to say what is worth valuing and what is not worth valuing. You get to say what is worth giving my life to and what is not worth giving my life to. You're the one who gets to say this path leads to life and this path leads to death. And honestly, if we think about the kingdom of God, we cannot miss the political implications of it. Your kingdom come is inherently political. You cannot say that the gospel does not intersect social and political uh, realities when the implication, the primary uh, metaphor is the kingdom of God. Now, we don't use the word kingdom a lot. That's not how our government and our uh, uh, context is set up. But when Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, the hearers of his day certainly knew what he was talking about. Jesus was making a political statement to a new allegiance, to a different kind of kingdom, to a different type of king, where there was a different set of rules, and there were a different set of laws, and there is a different set of values, and there's a different way of thinking who should march up the hierarchy and who should march down the hierarchy. Rome, at the time, had its own set of rules. It had its own set of values. It had its own set of socio-political hierarchy. The Jewish community at the time had its own set of rules and, and values and socio-political hierarchy. And Jesus comes right into the middle of all of this, and he says, you should pray this way. God, let your kingdom come so that your rule and your value and your hierarchy would be established in its fullness on earth as it already is in heaven. And we get a glimpse of what these values are and what this kingdom looks like in the Sermon on the Mount. We get a glimpse of what Jesus' political platform might be in this massive sermon on the kingdom of God. And so when we pray this prayer, what we're hoping for to become a reality on earth is that the poor in spirit and the mourners and the meek and the, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and the merciful and the pure and the peacemakers would be held at a higher esteem and would be elevated to positions of power and prestige where anger is equated to murder and lust is equated to adultery, where your word is your bond, and where you withhold retaliation and seek for ways to love your enemy. God's kingdom is one that actively takes on the needy by the generosity of those who are not, because those who have are more concerned about storing up their treasures in heaven than they are about their hoarding their treasures on earth. But the question is, is this the kind of kingdom that we want? Because so often it looks different than the kingdoms that we have and the kingdoms that we pursue. Your kingdom come is saying, God, order the world in the same way that it is in heaven. But is this the kind of ordering of the universe that you really want? Would you fight for this? Would you vote for this? Would you really entrust setting of the rules to God and not yourself. 
Again, it's one thing to say, God, may your kingdom come, when in our heads we have all kinds of things out there, all kinds of rules and laws and the way the world we think ought to operate because those people would not be in power who are in power and these people who are not in power would be in power and those laws would be changed to these laws and these things would be that instead of this. And so we look out at the world and we say, yes, God's rule and reign, we want it to come because we want these things to change. But again, if we ask ourselves, can I let God make the rules in my life? Can I let God call the moral balls and strikes in my own life? Can I let God say, do not pursue this and pursue that? Don't care about these things, rather care about these things. This is the road that leads to life. This is the road that leads to death. This is who you are. This is how you should live. This is what you should do. Are we willing to relinquish that to God? You see, before we can pray, God, impose your kingdom on the world, we must first say, God, impose your kingdom in my life. I want to live under the rule and the reign of Jesus. God, get the attention. God, have the power. And then finally, God, take control. If your kingdom come is about setting the rules and the values, then your will be done is about the outcomes. In other words, what's going to happen to me? And if I'm honest, all of these are are hard to pray if I'm truly praying these things. But this is probably the hardest for me because I want to be in control. I want to control the way that you perceive me. I want to, I see my kids and who they're becoming and starting to drive and all these things, and I want to be in control. I see where my life is heading in this direction or that direction, and I want to be in control. I see my business and my finances, and I want to be in control. I want to guide and direct the outcomes because I want to be in control. And then I think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Very early in the morning before he was to be crucified and put to death, and we find him praying to the Father, and he says, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will but your will. You see, Jesus knew exactly what was before him. It was no mystery. Jesus knew before the foundations of the world exactly what was going to happen and when. And yet he willingly came, knowing full well what was going to happen. You see, it's one thing to pray, oh God, let your will be done in this situation or that situation because we're completely blind and completely powerless of what is going to happen in the future. But what if you knew exactly what and how was going to happen in front of you and you still prayed, God, I don't want that to happen, but I willingly submit to your will, let your will be done. Honestly, I don't know if I could pray that prayer. Jesus knows And yet he asks, Father, can this cup pass from me? Is there any way that what's about to happen does not have to involve my suffering and my death? Is there any other way that this can take place without me having to die? And the Father's answer to the Son is no, there's not. I wonder if I could pray that prayer and get a no and ever pray that prayer again. Or ever pray again? Can I, will I actually relinquish control to God? You see, I think our default is to function in life as if it's either governed by choice or by chance. Either we're in control or nobody's in control. Either we feel secure because we see our outcomes coming, manifesting before us, and we have this reassurance of somehow we have some kind of agency in the world, or we see that our choices can't really substantially change anything, and so we realize our own weakness, and and it seems as though the entire universe is governed by chance and chaos. And what this prayer is is a declaration that we are not in control, but somebody else is. Friedrich uh, Buechner He's an American theologian and a writer. He's written several books. He has a devotional book that's called Listening to Your Life. And he writes this. It's a little long, but track with me. It's really good. He says, in the Episcopal order of worship, 
the priest sometimes introduces the Lord's Prayer with these words. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say. The word bold is worth thinking about, he says. We do well not to pray the prayer lightly. It takes guts to pray it at all. You cannot pray it in the unthinking, perfunctory way we usually do, if only, but only if you disregard what it is saying. Thy will be done is what we are saying. It is the climax of the first half of the prayer. We're asking God to be God. We're asking God not to do what we want, but to do what he wants. We're asking God to make manifest the holiness that is now mostly hidden, to set free in all of its terrible splendor the devastating power that is now mostly restraint. Thy kingdom come on earth is what we're saying. And if that were to suddenly happen, what then? What would stand and what would fall? Who would be welcomed in and who would be thrown out? Which of, any of the, which of any of our most precious visions of what God is or what human beings are would prove to be more or less on the mark and which would turn out to be as phony as a $3 bill? Boldness indeed. To speak those words is to invite the tiger out of the cage and to unleash a power that makes an atomic power look like a warm breeze. You need boldness in, the, in another way to speak the second half. Give us, forgive us, don't test us, deliver us. It take, if it takes guts to face the omnipotence that is God, it takes perhaps no less to face the impotence of ourselves. We can do nothing without God. We can have nothing without God. Without God, we are nothing. It is only the words, our Father, that makes the prayer bearable. If God is indeed something like a Father, then as Something like children, maybe we can risk approaching him anyways. You see, Jesus asks us to do three things in this portion of the prayer. To reflect attention, to submit to authority, to release control. That is what we're made for. And if I am to stand up here and ask you to do that in any sincere way, if there's any way that these three requests makes any sense to ask him to hallow his name, to ask for his kingdom to come, to ask for his will to be done, it is only if the four, first four verses of the prayer are true. That is the only way it makes sense. It is the only kernel of hope that we have. It's the only thing that tethers our heart and anchors our soul. To be able in any wholehearted way to pray this prayer, the first four words must be true. Our Father in heaven. That's it. Never pray this prayer to anyone or anything else. It is only that that makes this prayer prayable. That we, ref- that we are reflecting, that we are submitting, that we are releasing to our Father in heaven who loves us as a good Father so much so that he sent his Son, Jesus, to die for us in order to make us his own and to bless us with every spiritual blessing in heaven. But if we think about it, it creates a conundrum. Because on the one hand, we respond, wow, what a father. That he loves his children so much that he would send his son to die for them. But on the other hand, we have to say, wait. The father sent his son to die for his children? What might he ask me to do? This father is the kind of father that would send his children to die on the behalf of some greater good. What might he actually ask me to do? But you see, part of inviting the tiger out of the cage and unleashing a power that makes an atomic power look like a warm breeze, this whole faith thing is trusting in our Father in heaven is a Father that knows what we do not know. Our Father was willing to ask the Son to come to the cross to bear the unbearable, to die in the place of sinners because the Father could see the resurrection on the other side. The Father knew what appeared to be the greatest devastation and destruction and loss was actually the greatest victory of all time. So absolutely, our Father in heaven is the kind of Father that might ask you to walk into what appears to be a great loss or a great pain or even a great death. And yet still, our Father is asking, would you trust me? Even if I ask you to walk down a tunnel that looks dark and dangerous, would you trust me anyways? When it makes no sense, 
will you trust him anyways? When you cannot uh, understand the outcomes and they don't look like what you want them to be, would you trust him anyways? When the rules and the laws and the values make no sense, would you trust him anyways? When you want to self-preserve, would you trust him anyways? Because yes, it is the father who sent his son to die on the cross, but it's the same father who rose him from the grave three days later, who loves his children and loves his son. This is the only way we can pray this prayer. It's the only way that we will pray this prayer. And so when we pray this prayer, when we are reflecting more and more attention towards God, when we are submitting more and more of our life to God, when we are relinquishing more and more control to Him, what happens is we begin to flourish as His people because that is what we are made for. You weren't made to have all the attention. It will destroy you. You weren't made to have the power it will crush you, and you were not made to have the control. It will leave you feeling filled with anxiety and constantly striving for more. But to live life abundantly, to live life the way that God intends for you to live, to live as his people who are flourishing under his rule and reign, is to entrust yourself more and more to God and to increasingly pray this prayer with conviction. Our Father in heaven, let your name be hallowed. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we call you our Father because that is who you are. You are intimate. You are close. You are near. You are our Father in heaven and yet you are transcendent and you are different and you are otherworldly. And it is in the tension of these two realities that we place our faith. You love us so much, Father, that there was no sacrifice too great for you. And you are so powerful that the greatest sacrifice of all time was not the end of the story. And it caused or required suffering and death because the greatest life was put to death. And you call us into this greater life with all the little deaths that it might require. And so, Father, help us to trust you. As we walk in them, as we draw, draw us to yourself, draw us into Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, and in this, may we see your faithfulness, that you sustain us, that you care for us, that in this, that you are changing us and making us more and more into the people that you have recreated us to be. So, Father, I pray as we contemplate the Lord's Prayer that we think about our Father who is in heaven, what it means for him, for you to make your name hallowed among us, for your kingdom to, to come and for your will to be done. Father, we pray that it will transform our life. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, each week we get to respond to the word in worship through communion. Communion is our union with Christ through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. A visual presentation of the gospel of what God in Christ has done for us. And so if you are a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you to join me in taking communion with each other. If you are uncertain or if you have questions about what it means to be a follower of Jesus or you just are not a follower of Jesus... I would ask that you would restrain from taking communion and rather I would direct your attention to page six on our bulletin. There are several prayers there that you can be praying uh, during this time. But Jesus, on the night before he was to be crucified, he took this Passover meal with his disciples and the scripture tells us, when the hour had come, Jesus and the apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I eagerly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, 
This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup, which is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Jesus holds up the wine, and he holds up the bread, and he says, This is my body, and this is my blood. It is the gospel in a meal, the gospel that is eaten and tasted. In other words, the bread is represented of Jesus' suffering sacrifice. It represents Jesus' perfect life, his perfect righteousness, his perfect obedience that is then given to us and given for us through faith. The wine or the cup represents Jesus' shed blood for forgiveness of sins, his death, his sacrificial death, dying in our place on our behalf for our sins so that we might find forgiveness and that we might be cleansed and that we might be justified in right standing before God. And so Jesus calls us to know him and to know his sacrifice through this meal. And so when we take of the cup and when we take of the bread, we are proclaiming this truth that through his life, we are given his righteousness. And through his death, we are given forgiveness. And by his resurrection, we are reconciled back to the Father. So I want to encourage you to take the bread. This is the body of Christ given for you. And to take of the cup, which is Christ's blood poured out for you. as we continue to worship this morning. Let my heart be a temple. Let that temple in the throne. Let the one who sits upon it be you and you alone. I surrender my
let your kingdom come in me. In my life, Lord, let it be as it is in heaven. Be enthroned upon our hearts. Take control of every part. Be the King of all we are, O oh God in heaven. I lift my hands and say that I need you. I lift my heart and say that I love you. I give my life. be seated. If you would just uh, pray with me for just a moment, uh, just really what we just sang. Uh, we really just prayed what the sermon, or saying what the sermon was, and so let's just take a moment and pray together. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that all that we are made to be, all that we will ever be, will only ever be found in you, and so we do pray that uh, in every area of our life that you would be the center, that we would seek to follow you in all things, that we would continue uh, to seek you in all ways. And so we confess that so often the time we forget that and we make it about us. And so we thank you that uh, in Jesus that we find forgiveness, that you welcome us into your family, that you continue to pursue us. And so we pray that we would be people that want your kingdom to come in our life each and every day, that we would want to follow you every moment of every day, seeking to make you known and to love you more fully. And so continue to do that work in and through us as we go this week, as we seek to love others in the way that you have loved us. Uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We have a few announcements before we dismiss, but the first one, I'm excited we get to recognize new members today. And so we try to do that every so often. We're regularly having new member classes as people go through that and they uh, hear what we're about and decide they want to be part of our church, then we want to invite them to come up and recognize them together. And a uh, couple what reasons we do this and, and the way we do this. One is, is if they come up, I want you to put names with faces, know who they are, welcome them into our church family. Most, make sure if you're a member here, you come up, uh, introduce yourself, make sure that you know them and welcome them. They're part of our church family. But also as we do this, we read through our church covenant together. And I'm going to ask those that come to affirm that they're holding to our church covenant. But it's also a reminder for us who are members of this church family to be reminded of what it is that we're promising to one another in our church covenant. And so I'm going to ask those that are being recognized today to come up, Gary and Nancy Worth, and Marshall and Jane Chambers, and then Tom and Mella Riley, if y'all would come up for just a second. And so as they do, I want you just to see their faces, know who everybody are, is. We have Marshall and Jane over here, Chambers, and then Gary and Nancy Worth, and then Tom and Mella. And, and there's six here. There's actually seven here because Mella is with child. And so our, their family's growing, and so that means our church family's growing again. So that's wonderful, wonderful good news. But what I want to do is I'm just going to read through our church covenant together for all of us, and then I'm going to ask you guys just to affirm that yes, that we want to promise that to one another through our church covenant. And then I'm going to ask the members of our church to stand and affirm to them, uh, back to them as well. And so let's just hear together our church covenant. As we trust, being brought by divine grace to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to give up ourselves to him and having been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we do now, relying on his gracious aid, solemnly and joyfully renew our covenant with each other. We will work and pray for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We will walk together in brotherly love as 
uh, as we become members uh, of the Christian church, exercising an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other and faithfully admonish and entreat one another as the occasion may require. We will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together nor neglect to pray for ourselves and others. We will endeavor to bring up as such as may at any time be under our care in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and by a pure and loving example to seek the salvation of our family and friends. We will rejoice at each other's happiness and endeavor with tenderness and sympathy to bear one another's burdens and sorrows. We will seek by divine aid to live carefully in the world, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, and remembering that as we have been voluntarily buried by baptism and raised again from the symbolic grave, so there is on us a special obligation now to lead a new and holy life. We will work together for the continuance of faithful evangelical ministry in this church as we sustain its worship, its ordinances, its discipline and doctrines. We will contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We will, when we move from this place as soon as possible, unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principle of God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. And so I'm just going to ask our, our new members that if you commit to, to doing that and seeking to be part of this church, that you'd just say we will. All right. And those of you that are members of Church of the Apostles, would you stand with me? And I'm just going to ask you as members of CODA, do you commit to these new members to pray for them, to care for them, to walk with them and their families as they seek to follow Jesus in every area of their lives? All right. Let's pray for them together. God, we thank you uh, for these new members, these new families that you've brought into our family of faith. And so we pray that you would just help us to love them well as they seek to love our church family well. Give us the spirit of unity that can only be found in you. And so I pray for each one of these families that are represented. I pray for our church family that you would continue to unite us in you and all things, that we would seek to love you well, that we would seek to fulfill all these things that we're, we're promising to one another, that we would make much of you, that we would seek to love you and to love those around us. We thank you for the opportunity to be part of your family. We thank you that it's all because of what Jesus has done for us, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. And you guys can be seated. Glad you're here. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we dismiss. Just want to let you know of a couple things that are going on right now. Uh, next week on Saturday, so this coming Saturday, uh, the 17th, is our Backyard Bible Club. Our uh, student ministry is going to be leading this time for our CODA kids. And so we want to invite not just our kids and our families to come for that. It'll be on Saturday from 10 to 12 uh, in the morning. And so, but also want to invite friends and neighbors, any kids that you know, grandkids, bring them for this. It's, it's a, basically like a, a one day VBS, but our student ministry is leading it. And so we see this as a great opportunity of kind of layered discipleship, as Andy and the student ministry have been working with these, with our students to now lead this for our younger kids. It's just a great picture of what discipleship looks like, and so love for you to come, bring your grandkids, neighbors, whoever you can round up, bring them with you. We'd love for them to come. That'll be Saturday from 10 to 12. Uh, also wanted to let you know, starting next Sunday before the worship gathering at 9 a.m. is our new member class. We do this pretty much quarterly. And so for three consecutive Sundays from 9 to about 10, a little after, uh, we meet right downstairs. There's actually stairs over here in the corner, if you're not aware, that go downstairs. And uh, we have our, our new member class down there. And so for three consecutive Sundays from 9 to 10 a.m. before worship gathering. And so starting next week, so the 18th, the 25th, and then August 1st will be those three weeks. And so if you're interested in knowing more about the church, it's not a commitment to join the church, but it's a great way for you to hear about what we're about and our philosophy of ministry and what we're doing. So we'd love for you to come if that pertains to you and be part of that and hear about what's happening here at CODA. And then I also want to let you know on the 8th of August, we're having churchwide picnic. It'll be at Athens Boat Club from 4 to 7 p.m. And as we gather there together, uh, we're going to do right there in the lake, we're going to have baptism as well. And so if you know someone or you're, you've been thinking about uh, what it means to follow Jesus and to be baptized, we'd love to talk to you about that as we celebrate that together. But it's also just a great opportunity for us as a church family to gather together and enjoy a meal and fellowship together. And so that'll be uh, August the 8th 
at Athens Boat Club from 4 to 7 p.m. And so if you need directions or more information, grab myself or Luke, and we'd be happy to tell you about that. And then lastly, just want to make sure everybody knew what was happening as one of our kind of outreach here as the church is we have been helping uh, with the worship gathering at the Oaks, which is an assisted living facility right down the road from us here, right off of 400. Uh, if you go down, I think it's right on the line of Dawson and Forsyth. I think it's in Forsyth County, but it's right on the line. And so we've been going and helping put on their worship gathering on Sunday mornings. And so uh, Dan Fitzpatrick, one of our elders, is there this morning uh, helping with that. We've had different people volunteering to go and help set up for that time, being there just to love on the people that are there. Uh, one of our, our dear members here for a long time, Bill Burt, lives there. And so Bill is part of that community. And so what we're doing is, is we taking a few people to go and help set up and just be there and worship with them on Sunday mornings. And so if that's something you're interested in doing, would you grab myself or Luke or one of the elders, and we'd love to give you information as we're kind of assembling uh, just a, a calendar of when you can go and help. And so if that's something that you'd be interested in doing, it's just a great way for us to love on our neighbors and be there with them. And so please see us if, if that's something that God's placing on your heart to go and be part of. And so I think that is it for announcements. If you would stand with me for the benediction uh, from Hebrews this morning. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.